Imam Hussain. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And as, I, as, as uh, Dr. Spiller said, that I am from Florida State University and I am doing my PhD. Now, uh, actually, I changed the title of the slide a little bit uh, to make it a little more inclusive. And I'm going to talk about some of the uh, wire manufacturing and heat treatment related uh, current limiting factors in Bismarck 2212 superconductor wire. So uh, Bismarck 2212 is the only high field uh, tube press superconductor uh, that is available nowadays. And here is how the superconductor looks like. Uh, we have um, the wire surrounded by a silver 0.2% magnesium sheet and the superconducting filaments, uh, they are embedded in a silver matrix. Now, um, the wire is too stable. And as you can see from here, it's multifilamentary. So which reduces the AC loss. And also, um, this wire is suitable for high field magnet applications above 25 Tesla. Now, despite all these uh, advantages, um, till that Bismarck 221, the highest critical current density that has been achieved for Bismarck 212 is still less than 1% of its deep airing current density. Um, on the other hand, for something like navium tie, its, it's critical current density is about 20 to 30% of its deep airing current density. So uh, there is still a, a lot of room for improvement of the wear the conductor and uh, me and my colleagues at Applied Superconductivity Center are working to understand some of the current, current limiting factors and we are trying to improve the wire. Now, the wire is made in uh, powder and tube method, uh, PIT. So uh, this is basically you put to want to powder in a silver tube, draw it down, stuck it, and then they put the alloy sheet around the wire is redrawn and we end up with this kind of single stack structure. However, nowadays, uh, single stack is no longer being used and we use mostly the double stack geometry for Bismarck 2212. And for this study, we are uh, using, a, as I said, a double stack wire and it has an architecture of 85 by 18. That means it has 18 filament bundles, and each of these bundles have uh, 18, 85 filaments in them. We are using four different diameter wires, uh, and they are drawn from the same wire. That means they all have the same powder uh, with uh, different diameter, but they have different diameters. And in 212 wire, there are three types of bundle. We have these tetragonal shaped bundles, uh, the pentagonal shaped bundles, and hexagonal shaped bundles. Now, these four diameters, as I said, are drawn from the same wire. So what you can expect that the smaller diameter wire will have smaller filaments, and the larger diameter wires will have larger filaments, which you can see from this plot. However, one thing that we found during this study is that even uh, within different, within the same wire, or the same diameter wire, the filament size varies between bundle shapes and the tetragonal bundles, they have the smallest filament and the pentagonal and hexagonal bundles, they have larger filaments. And when we are doing this study and we have seen that uh, even in, within the same bundle, there is a wide distribution of filament size. So here, uh, this is the filament size distribution in hexagonal bundle of a as drawn uh, 1.3 millimeter wire. And as you can see that the filament size uh, varies from about 110 micrometer square to 260 to 270 micrometer square. Now, uh, we didn't really expect this uh, type of wide variation in this much to do on, in the filament size. So, uh, this prompted us to investigate whether there is any longitudinal variation in filaments uh, cross section in as, as received wire. To uh, investigate this, what we did, uh, we took a Bismarck 212 wire and we did progressive polishing. So we took a cross section at uh, zero depth and another one in five millimeter depth. And here is the color coded area map. Uh, of this, these two are the same bundles, but they are just five millimeter apart. 
Now, if you look closely over here, same filaments, five millimeter apart, you'll see that uh, there is variation in filament size uh, in different cross section. So this filament over here, it's uh, around one uh, 102 micrometers square at zero depth and around 124 micrometers square at uh, five millimeter. So this is getting larger from zero to five millimeter depth. Whereas this filaments is getting smaller from zero depth to five millimeter depth. So this shows that there is sausaging in this mod two to one to round wear, and the sausaging is not sympathetic. So um, to quantify this, to quantify the extent of how much sausaging is there, we calculated the percentage of area reduction where we use this equation. We always compare the smaller cross section with the larger cross section. And here is what we have found. So here, what you are seeing is the distribution of uh, percent of area reduction for a 1.3 millimeter wide hexagonal bundles. And you can see that some of the filaments, uh, they show about 35 to 40 percent reduction in their cross-sectional area between the two cross section that we have checked. And the distribution doesn't really change much for this 1.3 millimeter wear uh, uh, between um, among uh, different bundle shapes, both pentagonal and hexagonal, uh, tetragonal bundles. They show similar distribution uh, when compared to the hexagonal bundles. And when we looked at one millimeter wear, we have we found something similar. However, if you look at, at, especially at these tetragonal bundles here. Uh, one millimeter wear, which has the smallest filament size, you'll see that the area reduction uh, now increases up to 50 to 55 percent for some filaments, whereas for tetra uh, 1.3 it was 30 to 35 percent maximum that we found. Now, what does this mean? Uh, Probably you have noticed that only a few filaments are showing very high percentage of uh, sausaging or area reduction uh, between two cross section. However, uh, what we did, we checked only two cross sections over here, but in a kilometer length where possibly many of the filaments go through this type of uh, large sausaging. And the current carrying capacity of this mod 2212 uh, is limited by the smallest cross section of the filament uh, of these filaments along their length. And so uh, even before we start with the heat treatment, the current carrying capacity is pro pro probably severely limited by uh, this type of sausaging. And the sausaging appears to get worse as we decrease the filament size. So for a smaller diameter where as the previous slide showed, the situation is much worse. Now, after uh, we receive the wear, in, uh, it's in, in a powder stage. So we need to do a partial melt processing heat treatment to ensure the connectivity uh, between superconducting grains. And this is the heat treatment that we use. It has a maximum temperature of 888 degrees Celsius. Uh, the 2212 melts at around 884 and forms a liquid and two solid phases, the alkaline RQ plate and copper free phases. And the resolidification starts at around 872 degrees Celsius. So, Mm, uh, at the, uh, at the, um, by this sol solidification, we get the Visma 2212 by a peritectic reaction between the liquid and the solid phases. And uh, between these two temperatures, um, between uh, 872 and, and the room temperature, the grain growth and oxygen over doping of Visma 2212 occurs. The whole process, it uses uh, one bar oxygen partial pressure and 50 bar over pressure is used to ensure that there is no uh, bubble formation inside the wire. Uh, so recently, the heat treatment has been developed a lot. Instead of one bar processing, uh, we are using 50 bar over pressure uh, with, and also the powder made by the manufacturer is quite good nowadays compared to our early days. So uh, that has made Bismarck 221 to a very promising candidate for high field magnet application. 
However, uh, the heat treatment window for uh, Bismar 2212 is still remain very small. And if we change the maximum temperature of the heat treatment uh, slightly, that can uh, degrade the wire critical current significantly. And a good example for this uh, is the champ so-called champion wire, um, um, which has produced the record engineering current density for Bismar 2212 uh, till date. When the maximum temperature of the heat treatment is around 885.5 degrees Celsius, we get a uh, engineering critical current density of 1900 ampere per millimeter square. However, raise that temperature by eight degrees and the J drops to almost half of this record value. <laughs> now, this is something I have shown before the heat treatment schedule. Now I'm going to introduce a new term which we call the time in the melt. And we define is it as the temper, uh, time spent between these two temperatures, the 884 where 212 melts and 872 where the solidification starts. Former graduate students from our lab, Teming Shen and Maxim Matras, they have showed that the performance of Bismarck 2212 doesn't really depend much on the Tmax, but rather on the time spent in the melt state. And um, the T-melt for a standard heat treatment is usually between three to four hours. Now, if you look at this cooling rate during solidification, it's quite slow, only 2.3 degrees Celsius per hour. So if you increase the T max by about two degrees, it can increase the T melt by around one hour. Now, what changes if we increase the T melt? So this is the two uh, images that I show um, two slides earlier, earlier. Now here in this record day sample, the T melt was only 2.7 hours. And here in this sample, the T melt is 6.4 hours. And you can see that there is uh, the microstructural differences. Here, there is interfilament bonding, and the bonding situation is much worse in this uh, in this uh, web, uh, in this cross section. So you can see that the breeze, um, interfilament breezes that formed here are quite large. So this type of interfilament bonds, they form when the Prisma 2212 melts by the dissolution of silver at the grain boundary. So here I'm trying to graphically represent this. So what I'm showing are is two Prisma 2212 filament separated by a silver grain boundary. So when 2212 melts, the silver is dissolved preferentially at a grain boundary and the silver diffuses away and reprecipitates somewhere else away from the grain boundary. Eventually, a liquid channel is formed and the 2212 grain forms in this channel. Now, previous studies done by uh, my colleague Fumitake Kamitani and Abhi Abulawole, uh, their work showed that this type of interfilament bond uh, disrupts the texture of Bismarck 2212 and that reduces the critical current density. And in this current study, we are trying to understand, further understand the microstructural, uh, microstructural impact of uh, interfilament bonding and how it's impacting the critical current density. Now, uh, before I go to the experimental section, there is another thing. So I have uh, shown this image before where I talked about different uh, bundle shapes and how the filament size varies between these bundle shapes. Now, another uh, um, parameter that varies between this bundle shape is the interfilament separation. And you can see that the tetragonal bundle, once again, showing the smallest separation between the filaments and the pentagonal and hexagonal, there, the, over there, the interfilament separation is slightly larger compared to the tetragonal bundles. And this is important because interfilament bonding uh, is a uh, function of interfilament separation. The closer the filaments are, the easier it is for them to bond together. And uh, as I said, the performance of Bismarck 2212 depends highly on the time in the melt. So in our study, what we did, uh, we varied the time spent in the melt, st melt state for our samples, and we have used four different time in the melt. 
So what we did, uh, we for the first batch of sample, the 0.2 hour time in the melt, we heat, heated the uh, wire to about 888 degrees Celsius and cool, uh, cool it down from there using a special overpressure quench furnace. And then for the next batch of sample time in the melt, two hours, we started the slow cooling and went up to 875 degrees Celsius. Uh, just before the solidification starts and we quench the sample from there and got a sample that has two hour time in the melt. And for higher time in the melt, like three hour and four hour, we raise this temperature by two degrees and that increased the time in the melt by one hour. So we ended up with samples that had four different time in the melts. Now here, uh, uh, this is a quantification of interfilament bonding and showing the percentage of how many filaments are, are bonded together. Now, as you can expect, uh, the tetragonal bundles for this 1.3 millimeter wire, they are showing the maximum amount of bonding because they have the smallest separation uh, between filaments. And this is uh, the, the same trend, the, all the wire follow the same trend with tetragonal bundles showing the maximum amount of interfilament uh, bonding. And as you decrease the di wire diameter, which also decreases the interfilament separation, the amount of filament bonding increases. For example, for this 0.8 millimeter wire tetragonal bundles, about 60% of the filaments are bonded after four hour time in the melt. Now, what does it do? Uh, so the interfilament separation uh, and what's its microstructural impact? So he, here, what I'm showing uh, is a sample. Uh, this is 0.8 millimeter wire tetragonal bundle, and it has spent 0.2 hour or only 12 minutes in the time in the uh, 12 minute in the melt state. So this is not a very long time as you can understand, and still you can see some of the filaments bonded, but the bonding scenario is not that bad. However, when we increase the time in the melt to four hours, you can see that many more filaments are bonded together now. Now, here is reasons like this, uh, where multiple filaments are bonded together. This type of bonding, uh, they actually increase the from filament size of the filament cavity of bismuth 2212 and disrupt the, um, locally disrupt the texture of bismuth 2212 grains. Uh, um, however, what we found in this study that there are also regions like these where uh, the filaments are getting smaller. So what happens we believe here is as the filaments bond together in this region, uh, it reduces the interfacial, interfacial energy and as a result, the liquid from nearby unbonded region moves to this region, and we get uh, we end up with this type of area and this, uh, the cross-sectional area fluctuation along the well length. So, as you can understand, the current uh, of this wire will be limited by the smallest uh, cross-section of superconducting filament, and. <clears throat> While in this particular image, only a few filaments are showing um, uh, area reduction like this, in a kilometer length wire, possibly many, if not all the filaments go through this type of reduction in cross section. So for a quantity, uh, to get an idea, a quantitative idea about uh, the extent of uh, area fluctuation along the length, we actually used uh, this type of, uh, this equation over here, where we uh, compared the average area of the smallest 5% filaments for a given time in the melt with the average area of the smallest 5% filaments for 0.2 or time in the melt where there is not much bonding. So the filament size doesn't really change uh, significantly. And here is the results. Uh, as you can expect, the tetragonal bundle, which shows the maximum amount of filament bonding. Uh, they are the area reduction of the 5% uh, smallest filament is more significant. And we get the similar thing for 
the 1.2 millimeter wire. However, the overall the scenery was not bad. It's only uh, about 10% reduction. And but when we looked at the smaller diameter, one millimeter wire and one point uh, 0 0.8 millimeter wire, now we can see that some of the filaments, so some uh, the smallest 5% filaments for 1.0 millimeter tetragonal bundle, they are showing about 25% decrease uh, yeah, after four hour time interval. And for eight hour 0.8 millimeter, the, this decrease is about 50%. And uh, we see this, um, uh, the impact of this uh, area fluctuation when we looked at the critical current density of these wires. You can see that all the wires, their ice um, JC drops with increased time in the melt. However, for 1.0 millimeter and 0.8 millimeter, uh, the, the, their JC drops much more stiffly compared to this uh, 1.3 and 1.2 millimeter wire. And when we looked at the N value, which is, um, uh, uh, so we have found that the larger diameter wires always shows a uh, larger N value compared to um, the smaller diameter wires, which indicate that they have better connectivity between the filaments. And also with increased time in the melt, the N value drops for this wire. So which um, possibly indicates that the filament quality is getting worse with uh, time spent in the melt state. So to summarize, uh, we have um, interfilament bonding uh, reduces the critical current dens uh, density of Bismarck 212 uh, by disrupting uh, the texture as previously shown by my colleagues, Takka Metani and Avila Laulay. And in this study, we have found that it also causes the area fluctuation along the length of the wear. And not on the, all the bundle shapes contribute similar to the um, interfilament bonding. The tetragonal bundles shows most bonding and most area reduction along the length. And possibly this type of bundles are the major contributors to the JCD reaction with uh, increased time in the melt. And additionally, we have found evidence of sausaging in as drawn or as received wire even before the heat treatment, which can also contribute to the JCM, uh, uh, which can also be a current limiting factor in Bismarck 212. And we believe that improved wire manufacturing or wire drawing and discrete filaments, which will reduce interfilament bonding can potentially make Bismarck 2212 and higher JC and more stable conductor that can retain its performance with uh, increased time in the melt. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um